look, the only part of object-oriented programming that even makes any sense at all is to just think of it as API boundaries. And you don't need to think about objects at all. You just need to think about sometimes we want to break a system apart because of Conway's law or our brains can't think of the whole thing. The goal there is just figure out what the right primitives are that people use across that boundary. That is what your job is. Don't think about objects. Don't think about associating. The idea of associating a method with data, don't ever think about that. It's always bad. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Game Engineering Podcast. Today, I had the honor to talk to Casey Muratori, a well-known programmer and educator and author of Handmade Hero series, over 700 of episodes of him building a game from scratch live. More recently, Casey is focused on performance-aware programming course on computerenhance.com. I am a happy subscriber of this course and I can't recommend it enough. It teaches you how the software you write maps to hardware components below and how to utilize them efficiently. In this discussion, we focus on Casey's work experience. When did he learn the stuff that he knows now? He worked at Rad Game Tools and I inquire him a lot about how the company was run and what he did there. He also mentions why and when he switched from object-oriented programming to more procedural style. And with that, let's meet Casey. How, how much of the programming you were doing before you joined a uh, university and then uh, how much university have prepared you for what next to come? Uh, well, that's a really easy answer. I didn't go to university. What? I started programming right out of uh, high school. Really before that, I, I sort of nominally finished high school, but I didn't really want to. Uh, I just kind of was okay. like, well, I maybe should in case anyone ever asks. No one ever has. So I, I feel kind of dumb sticking around for the last two years of high school. I probably should have just not. Um, but, you know, you don't necessarily know that at the time. And, you know, I, you can never be sure like what you're going to do, but I probably shouldn't have bothered. So I, I never went to university. I, at the time was like, well, if I'm going to go somewhere, I kind of wanted to go to, uh, people may or may not be familiar with this place, but it's called Brown University. It's a, it's an Ivy League school in uh, Rhode Island. And mainly they're, you know, as far as computers are concerned, they're known because uh, like Van Damme of Foley and Van Damme, the standard computer graphics textbook, he's like kind of one of the big guys there or, or was at the time, right? I mean, he's probably retired by now <laughs> or or if he's even alive, I don't know, he'd be very <laughs> old. Uh, and so like I had, I that was like a standard textbook at the time. And so I was like, well, that must be a good place to go if you wanna learn computer graphics, right? So I applied to there and I was accepted to go there, but I didn't really want to go. So I ended up just moving out to Washington, which is where I still live, uh, to just work with some ex-Microsoft people. And I just have sort of always been in games after that. So I have no university experience uh, based on what people have you know, that I know of have said about university. <laughs> I don't think I missed anything. <laughs> Um, so I don't regret that at all. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, in terms of me saying like what I, you know, did university prepare me for anything or what did I know beforehand? 100% I knew beforehand because I never went. Uh, and, uh, I do think that there's, uh, like, it's not like I just knew everything that I would need to know. That's certainly not true. And I kind of, I taught myself like linear algebra and some of those things that, Obviously, like, you know, when I went to high school, the math curriculum is, I mean, it's garbage. Uh, it's not really the teacher's fault. It's just the actual curriculum, at least in the U.S., the math curriculum is very poor. Um, it might be better in Europe, uh, but, well, in various say, places. But... When, when you say poor, what do you mean? Because, like, I'm from Europe, so I, I don't know okay. what do you mean by that. So, I. Uh, I guess the easiest way to say it would be if I look at the the way that I think about math now I'm not I'm not a particularly strong math person either way so there's kind of two ways you can look at math there's the like utilitarian way of like what are the math things I needed to know for programming 
just because I want to do programming and there's math stuff I might want to know, right? And then there's also the like theoretical math people who are like, they really just like math. My assumption would be neither of those two types of people would be very happy with the kind of math curriculum. For the utilitarian people, it's like, I mean, look, I think I got through all of high school. Like we have, an, there's an entire year of quote unquote geometry. There's half a year of trig. It was like eight, algebra two trigonometry is like one year thing. I don't think a dot product or cross product were ever mentioned. Those are like the most fundamental things. If you want to start talking about geometry, like I have never in my entire like programming career really needed to know like the various geometry postulates for like proving two angles yeah. equal to each other. Like once in a blue moon, like one time, I think I sort of was doing a thing, but I didn't really end up doing it that way because it was just you know, like, like, I don't really need to do that here because you tend to just use law of science, law of cosines, and you just work from there. You wouldn't go like, oh, is a SAS postulate here? What if, right? Like, so they spend a huge amount of time on stuff that you never will use. Or if you will use it, it's very rare and you could have just looked it up quickly. And no amount of time on the actual bread and butter. Like, how do we actually solve geometry problems? Like, we use all these other tools that were never mentioned, right? So from a, from a practitioner's point of view, it's basically four wasted years. They don't teach you that. They don't teach you basic concepts like what basis functions really are. Like the concept that like X squared versus X are just completely different basis functions. So like if you just have an equation like AX squared plus BX equals 5X squared plus 6X, you just know the answer immediately of what A and B are. Because x squared and x can't, they don't share, they're orthogonal is in a sense, right? They can't be used to recreate each other in any way. And so even though I'm, I'm not theoretically math knowledgeable, and I wouldn't even be comfortable saying that the term orthogonal was correct there, right? Like, <laughs> like a mathematician may come and correct me like, well, technically, we wouldn't say orthogonal, we would say this, right, or whatever. But from a practitioner's perspective, those are the, that's the most critical way to think about these things. Like thinking about how to solve the quadratic equation and doing it manually are absurd things to be spending weeks of a math class on when you never taught someone how to think about just the fundamental ways in which these things interact. And furthermore, from a modern perspective, when we think about computing, when we think about things like sines and cosines and uh, like how we deal with transcendental functions, the basic core concepts of like, how do those things get evaluated? Never mentioned. Our teachers would never have known. Like they wouldn't have known things like they don't know what like Pate coefficients are or something. Like I, maybe they had them, someone mentioned them once in some college course, right? But they wouldn't know that these are like the most important foundational things that you could teach someone in a modern practitioner context. So in a way, it's like, I'm pretty sure that a theoretical mathematician would come along and say, yeah, these four years were garbage because you didn't learn any theory, right? Like, I don't know what a division ring is. I still have no idea. So it wasn't like they set you up for that, right? And they definitely didn't set you up for a practitioner because that I can say from experience, I had to learn all of it after like every last little bit of it, right? Um, and the way that they focused on the things uh, and, and how they were taught and where they chose to spend their time was completely opposite of, you know, going back to it now and saying, computing is how we do math now. If you're going to be a practitioner, these are the things you really should be focusing on. Almost everything they actually taught me was a fringe, was fringe stuff that, you know, I'm not saying it's bad. Like, there's never math that's bad to know. It's not, it's not bad to know like how to prove two angles congruent, but if you were looking at how am I going to spend this year efficiently to teach the general population things they might need to know when they're going into these fields, it was all backwards. It's like, no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to don't do any of this this way. Like, here's what you actually should be focused on, because this is what people need to know first and foremost. And then if you have spare time, sure, angle congruence, no problem. Like. It might be nice to do a couple of days on how did we prove the law of cosines or something like that, right? Sure, but that shouldn't be a year of thinking about how to prove angles congruent and no discussion of critical things uh, like, you know, or like 
you know, or okay. how to orthogonalize a vector or, you know, like how to orthogonalize a basis system or things like that. Those are way more important, right? Yeah. Um, and just as simple. Uh, they're not more complicated. They're, it's just a different avenue. So I guess that's what I mean by the math curriculum being bad. I, and, and I don't know, like, are other areas better? I went to a pretty good high school by high school standards in the U.S., its placement rate into places like Ivy League universities and things like that, or colleges in general, was very high. So it wasn't like my high school was like really bad. And oh, if you just went to the good high school, even better. So I think it was pretty representative of what the average math curriculum would be. If anything, it might have been slightly better than the average math curriculum, and it was still garbage. So does that give a better picture, like yeah, roughly? Yeah, 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 yeah. So like it was more about like math puzzles than pretty much anything else because it wasn't even for like traditional math theory math it wasn't for practitioners math and it's the same in europe in terms of curriculum although okay. that product that product was mentioned in high school so Me, this, and maybe this. i'm trying to think if it was ever mentioned we just yeah. never worked with it right like when i got out and was like learning this stuff it was like wow these things are super powerful we didn't learn any of this and you can do them like a dot product in in 2D, obviously, cross product, if you weren't going to start teach built 3D, it would just be the perp dot product. But like, you know, the the actual dot product works in any dimension. So there was no reason they couldn't have taught us that. And it works just as well in 2D as it does in 3D, right? There's no yeah. limitations where it's like, oh, people won't really understand this because it's 2D. So, you know, a lot of those workhorse kind of things, they just never mention and they spend all their time on other things. You know, it's like, there, there was a month or more on UDU substitution and stuff like this. It's just like mostly what you're training people to do is stuff that you could just kind of vaguely tell them was a thing so that they understand it, but that Mathematica is going to do for you anyway. So the idea that you're going to sit there doing all, you, you know, you're spending most of your brain learning how to do a thing that if you knew, all you have to really know is how to identify something that could work this way. But you would never have to work it through and you wouldn't want to because you might make a mistake, right? Yeah. So I don't know. All of it just seems based on very antiquated notions of what you're going to be doing. And like I said, none of it's none of it's bad to know if you already knew all the important stuff. But the the, the focus is so backwards and there's so many things uh, uh, omitted, right? Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I thought it, it was really bad. And I had okay. to learn most of the stuff myself when I got out uh, of high school. So. I... I would posit that everybody who accomplished something had to learn a lot of things by himself. Like, it's very difficult to get through university. It's like, oh, it really prepared me like 95% of stuff <laughs> yeah. I know from university. Yeah. I don't think I heard that. Uh, but you, so after high school, did you go immediately to, to job uh, in terms of like programming? Yeah, uh, it, it wasn't necessarily a job, like I'll say job in quotes, because it was kind of a startup, which are always kind of like job is is okay. is a relative term in the startup <laughs> world. Right. But uh, so prior to that, I in when I was, I guess, junior, the summer, I think the summer between junior and senior year, I always have trouble remembering when. Uh, but I think it was the summer between junior and senior year. I interned at Microsoft because a friend of mine's father had gone to work at Microsoft. So, cause remember I, I don't live in Washington originally. I, I was from Massachusetts. So uh, I went out there for the summer and did an internship. And so I was kind of used to roughly like what you do if you're programming in a, in a normal like work environment. Like I learned how to use source code control, right? Which is when you're learning how to program at home in the 1980s, which was when I did most, right? I, I, 1990s was when I was, when I'm talking about now, but you know, I learned to program when I was much younger than that. You're not using source code control in the 1980s. You're lucky if you've even ever heard of source code yeah. control or if one even exists for the platform you're using at the time, like CVS sort of existed. Okay. Obviously, things like Git wouldn't come around for another 20 years, I right? Think or Git, something. Is, Git is like 2004. Um, yeah. Something. Uh, so, so, you know, it's 
it ex- the concept of source code control and some utilities utilities exist, but you'd never heard of it. When I in the '90s, when I was at Microsoft, they had SourceSafe, uh, which was their like product. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a crappy version control system, and so I kind of learned how that. Oh, okay, you check in, you check out code. I I get it. Uh, and like I learned, you know, about networked computing because like that really wasn't a thing. You know, if you're at home, you don't really have that. Uh, so like, oh, okay, there's like these domains, there's like an NT domain server and you lo- like, so I kind of learned like some of the things that, or, or even like email, right? Like we all know what that is now, but at the time, like the idea of emailing people, if you weren't at a university, you never had that. It wasn't a thing. I mean, in the eighties, there was no internet available to the, the common person, right? The, the layman on the street. That was the thing that existed only at universities or inside corporate environments where oftentimes they had their own versions. Like my father worked at a company called Digital Equipment Corporation, which people who are fans of historical computing will know is the people who brought you say the PDP-11 or the VAX, right? Um, he worked there and they had their own internal system called Deck Notes, uh, where they could post things and talk to each other. And they ha- it was like basically like Google Groups kind of a thing or you know a Usenet, like that kind of stuff. So there, those things existed for people in corporate computing not general corporate, you know, I'm sure like the typical, you know, grocery chain would not have had email, right? But but people who were like hardcore mainframe people, all that sort of stuff, they had it. Universities had it. And some of them were on ARPANET. So they were actually inter-institutionally linked or whatever, but it was pretty rare. So growing up in that era, you had no access to information. If you were going to learn something about programming, you had to do it by buying a book from the store. You had no access to things like email, you didn't know who programmed anything like like it's not like now where you can just go on YouTube and find out like who did what and hear from people who wrote the, your favorite game or whatever. Like that's none of that. Right. But the prog- but the learning from the book, it's there is something to it. Like I did this not that far ago and like it's a different level of experience and we tend to forget it now, I think, because of this like immediacy of this information in internet. It's like, oh, I can just Google it or I can, or I can ask ChatGPT how to do it. And it's like, yes. if you get the book and you go through this and like you pressure yourself, force yourself sometimes to like read all this arcane stuff they put in into a language or something, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it makes much more sense. Okay. Okay. Then, so you're saying that you moved, uh, you were doing an internship at Microsoft. Then. Yes. Okay. Yes. I did an internship at Microsoft. And then, uh, I went to work at like, there was a bunch of people at Microsoft who I met while I was there who were doing a startup company, which totally failed. But, uh, I went to work with them and uh, that was actually how I got like sort of in connected to the game industry. Uh, because like that allowed me to interact with people in that industry. And even though the startup failed, I ended up being like able to like from there, I knew enough people that I could just work in the industry from then on. And uh, it was pretty short time after that. Actually, I worked at Gaspar games for a little bit and, but only briefly. And then I worked at rad game tools after that for many years. And that was where I spent most of my time employed, like being, most of my time that I've been an actual employee, meaning working directly for someone else, not consulting, not working on my own, um, was at Rad Game Tools, which was, I don't know, five years, maybe start to finish, maybe six total, I don't know, something like that. Uh, and that's where I did most of the programming that is used widely. So like of my code that people actually have used widely, it's gonna be that. Um, because obviously we did licensable tech, so it kind of gets spread everywhere. Uh, so it's a pretty quick way to have your stuff used in a lot of places, right? If you I, was, I was looking this like up. That, yeah. I was looking this up. And first of all, on Rod Game Tools, now Epic Game Tools, right? There was yes. a, there is a list and it's outdated. There's a list. There's like, we, our yeah. tech is in like 5,400 games. And then there was a, another yeah. list, like Moby Games, I think was the website called. And they had like updated version of the list of the games. And they were like, I was trying to think of a game that was quite new that wasn't on this list. And I didn't <laughs> manage. It's crazy. Yeah, it's not really it's crazy. Uh, so uh, we did a couple different things that uh, are very popular <clears throat> So the biggest one by far, though, is the video codec. 
Yeah. So uh, Rad's like bread and butter for many years was first it was a it was called Smacker originally. It was an eight bit video codec. This was in the back in the days when games had to be two different color, palletized displays, and there really wasn't much you could do for video playback back then because most video playback solutions there just wasn't stuff. There wasn't like standards. MPEG wasn't suitable for speed and palletized uh, and stuff like that. So. It was the standard for old 8-bit DOS games. Then in the Windows era, they did a thing called Bink. And there's Bink and Bink 2. And those are, I mean, they're so ubiquitous that it's almost impossible to find a studio that doesn't use Bink for playing back their uh, videos. Even this day, Rad Game Tools doesn't really exist anymore. They decided to, they, they uh, Epic offered to buy them at one point because Epic was getting really huge and they wanted the tech. Uh, and the people. So they ended up getting merged into uh, Epic. So they no longer really even are a licensable, like like they're not trying to survive on licensed tech anymore. And still there's so many people who rely on that as the video codec that it's still being sold to this day. And uh, that's just how incredibly important this very niche technology was to an entire industry because everyone needs to play back video and nobody wants to try and use uh mpeg4 so off you go um so yeah when you were joining where when you were joining rad game tools what were your skills in terms of programming languages and like experience then um so at the time i was Sort of, so it's pretty interesting, actually. Uh, a lot of people, for whatever reason, I mean, people think whatever they want to think, right? Uh, and and I've learned better than to try to convince them otherwise. Uh, <laughs> so I just say stuff and I'm like, yep, everyone's going to be mad at this or they're going to just invent their own weird story that's totally false. Um, so I used to be, so about that time was the time when like, like you have to cast your mind back to a time when like C++ templates as a concept are fairly new, so new that, I mean, like you're, you pretty much have to use Microsoft's compiler because there isn't like Clang, for example, nowadays is pretty easy to use on Windows. It can generate PDBs natively. It can generate the XCs directly. You don't have to use like Ming or anything like this, right? Um, but at that time, if you were shipping on Windows, you pretty much, you pretty much had to use a Microsoft compiler. So, the Microsoft compiler couldn't even compile templates correctly most of the time. Like you, if you actually tried to use them, you would very rapidly hit cases where it would either internal compiler error or it would give you an error on code that technically was correct because they hadn't caught up to the standard or they just had bugs in the thing, right? So that's the error we're talking about. So <clears throat> C++ is at the point where it's added templates they're not quite the same as they are now. Like there was, they were more limited, even in the spec, obviously. And there's a bunch of things that aren't in that, you know, that are in the spec now that weren't in then. And the compiler is pretty far behind. So if you're trying to do like template metaprogramming, it's a bit rough. So I was still of the mindset that like, well, the people who make this stuff must know better than I do, right? And like, so object-oriented programming and weird template metaprogramming stuff is obviously good, right? And so that was mostly my mindset going into RAD was that sort of stuff. And I did all sorts of those things. Like if you looked at the math library, then it was weird, you know, it was templatized on like the dimensions of the matrix and whether or not you wanted to use double or float and all the sorts of things that you would normally consider now about like, you know, pretty standard template metaprogramming stuff. Uh, and of course, like I said, it was still kind of annoying though at that time because things that you would never expect the compiler to internal compiler error on now, it may well have. Even something as simple as like, oh, it's just M by N matrix of double. You might have hit some things because you were trying to put a, you know, a trait in somewhere effectively. Like so you're trying to put in some type definition to a thing and it wouldn't be able to reference the thing. And you're like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, so I went in with that mindset. And when I was going to RAD, that's, that's kind of what I knew. I had learned programming C as a child. And um, I was pretty proficient in it, I guess I would say. I learned C++ along the way uh, after I had gotten out of high school and like was exposed to it from other developers, thought it was presumably a good idea because like, why would people be doing it if it wasn't? The same, by the way, I see the same sentiment on Twitter, right? 
and people are always like, no, you know, these people, they must know what they're doing. I'm like, no, like disabuse yourself of that notion. A lot of people who make languages don't, don't have any idea what they're doing, right? It's like, how many, think of your own self. How many times have you been quite certain you were doing something correct only then to realize you were doing it wrong? Other people aren't magically smarter than you. They, they, don't, they don't know the future any better than you do, right? So you have to always be willing to expect that not only is what you're doing possibly wrong, but what other people are doing and claiming is good also could be wrong if you can't verify it. Like if you can't go and independently verify that they're correct using some other scheme, they're just as likely to be wrong as you are, unfortunately, because no one knows the future, right? Um, and so that was mostly the skill set that I went in there. And uh, when I went there, what I was doing at the time when I first joined was uh, Rad kind of wanted to start doing some 3D stuff. But I didn't have anyone there who did 3D, really. Uh, so I wrote the first version of their character animation library, Granny. which kind of, yes, uh, which kind of has a couple of different components. It's got exporters, because at the time there was no standard export format that included everything you needed. Like nowadays you kind of, well, at least you cross your fingers and you hope that there's a standard export format like Filmbox or something that will have everything you needed from the tool, right? None of that existed at the time. So if you wanted to extract animated characters from a tool, you needed an exporter. That was just, you just had, there was no way to actually use a, uh, an export feature from the tool and get all the data we actually needed. And then also there was a runtime component. So it was basically exporters for 3D Studio Max and Autodesk Maya. I think Autodesk Maya was, I, I, it might've only supported Max in the first version and then Maya in like a point update. I don't remember the order. We could go back and look at the change log, but it was at least Max with Character Studio. And then Maya came shortly thereafter because that's the other standard. Later, I think we added, like I added Lightwave, uh, but you know, it was really Max and Maya that the two were the two big ones. They still are today. Uh, and and then it has a runtime component, which like loads these things and plays it back for you, right? So I wrote that. <clears throat> and that was uh, all done in like the C++ template, uh, inheritance hierarchy, object-oriented style. Whole thing. So like, again, people don't think I've ever done this stuff. They're just like, oh, they just don't he doesn't understand the magic of object -oriented. No, I have shipped entire libraries in this style. I know exactly what they look like and how to do it. If you wanted me to ship an object-oriented light today, I could easily do that for you, right? Um, and so I shipped it in that style and it was an epic disaster. No pun intended, because it's just rad game tools at the time, right? Uh, and the reason for that was very simple. Shipping object-oriented code, object code sucks for integration. It's all of the principles of object-oriented fight the ability to integrate stuff. It's the whole paradigm is a lie. The, the lie is that if something's object-oriented, it will be easier for someone else to integrate because it's all encapsulated. But the truth is the op opposite. The more walled off something is, the harder it is for someone to integrate because there's nothing they can do with it. The only things they can do are things you've already thought of and provided an interface for. And anything you forgot, they're powerless. They have to wait for an update. So the entire concept of object-oriented programming is just, in my opinion, bad. It's just, it's a bad idea. It doesn't do what people claim that it does. And so what we did was for two, I decided as like, I don't think that went well. And when I look at the other programmers here who are much better than I am, like Jeff Roberts, who's the guy who does, did the uh, Smacker and Bink, the original versions of those, effectively by himself, um, and uh, John Miles, who was the person who wrote the Miles sound system, which was the standard sound system for gaming through the whole DOS era. Uh, they didn't do this stuff. Like, they, they didn't use that, really. They, they used C for most of these things, right? They didn't use objects. Jeff doesn't even use .cpp files. He's just .c. <laughs> He's like, I don't need any of it. I don't care, right? He's, he's so far in that direction, right? So I'm like, you know, if programmers better, who I can actually watch being better than me, not some random person who happens to be on a C++ committee who I look at what they've done, and I'm like, I don't, doesn't look like they've really necessarily done anything I'm all that impressed with. I look at these people who are like, absolutely crush what they're working on. They don't use this stuff. Why? Right? So for Granny 2, what I decided to do was, I'm just going to start back at C, and I'm only going to use features I can prove saved me code. 
right? Like if I can't prove that this thing is actually saving me time because I can write the code one way and the other way and see that, okay, now that was actually better, I'm not using it. So Granny2 is done almost entirely in C. It doesn't even use operator overloading for math. Um, and basically what I found is 99% of the things in C++ are not useful. <laughs> operator overloading, the one that I was like, this is actually useful, right? Uh, because I looked at the math code after I did that, and I was like, this is much more concise. Because I wrote it in Blaz style. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's basically like where you just have, you have all your primitive math functions, and you just, so like a, an actual thing like AX plus BY plus CZ is like a bunch of like, scaled x uh, scaled f mad right like you know or just just f mad i guess we would call it right so it's like f mad f mad f mad f mad f okay. with an accumulator right <laughs> oh and okay. it's like okay. it's like i'm like nope it's hard to read this code like like this is legitimately not good when i go back to this code and i want to edit it it's a pain in the butt like like i think it's actually better the other way and yeah maybe it's better to do that in some limited cases where i really need to control if the compiler is like screwing something up or something like that Sure, I'm not saying it's always best to have something look like math, but having operator overloading so I can just do vector math using normal symbols is better. I'm very confident saying that now. So I'm like, if I see a language that doesn't have operator overloading, I don't want to use it, right? So to this day, I still use CPP files. Even people always ask me like, why? Like why, you know, you don't, your code doesn't really look like C++. Right? I'm like, yes, it it does. It requires operator overloading. So there are some things from C++ this that one, I don't. This one yeah. feature. <laughs> um, sort of. I mean, I, I, I sort of use function name overloading sometimes too. Like I want my code to just read like is valid parentheses a thing. I don't necessarily want to have it be is valid gromulus and is valid, right? It just, it adds cognitive overhead because I'm like, I'm just asking if this thing is valid. I don't care which one it is. Go find the threat, right? Um, so just basic compile time dispatch is what we might call that. I think that's good as well. And C makes that harder, right? Uh, so there are some very limited things from C++ that have actually been official. Um, templates are trickier because templates, the reason I don't use them is not that reason, right? Like inheritance hierarchies are just garbage. They don't work. I would never use them again. Um, there's way better ways to do everything they do. But templates are much trickier. And what I sort of learned about templates at that time was that the cost of using them outweighs the benefit of using them, which is a very different statement than this thing is garbage, right? Templates do do useful work. They are just usually more trouble than they're worth. The syntax is pretty poor. Troubleshooting them as soon as they get at all complicated is not very much fun. They don't read cleanly after you're done with them, typically, just because of bad decisions in the way that they were set up. But they are at least trying to do something that would have been useful. And so what I usually say, you know, it's like people hear me talk online. I'm always like, object oriented programming is a waste of time. Don't do it. You'll never hear me say it about generic programming. Generic programming, I think, is a good idea. I think C plus, temp C plus plus templates, you could go either way. You could come down on the, mm, I'm saving time here at the margin, so it was better to use them. I think you can also come down the side of, I don't save time. If I just typed it in again, it would have saved more time because I can read it better and customize it easier than the template version. People scream and yell if you say one or the other, but it's like, no, I, I really think that's an area where C plus plus ended up just in this really uncomfortable middle zone of if it had just been twice as good as it was, they'd actually buckled down and made this really good generic programming, then it would be a no-brainer to use it. If it had been just a bit worse, it'd be a no-brainer to say never use it. But as it is, they hit this <laughs> middle area of like, if someone asks me, should I use templates or not? I'm like, eh? Yeah. I, I can't, it, there's not a right answer to that question. I could defend either side fairly vigorously and I just don't, so it's just personal preference, right? It's like, you have to figure out whether this is working better for you or not. It's that simple, right? So, um, so anyway, yeah, uh, I don't know if that, I, I'll pause now because I've said a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I was wondering, because you were talking a lot about how the granny code, you mentioned that object oriented version was not necessarily successful and the granny, at least the first one was a library, right? You were shipping the code. So people 
who licensed could interact with the code they needed to see and sometimes change the code. Is that correct? Um, so I guess what I would say is when you are shipping, so, so one of the things that I would stand by as a rule is if you are not in a, you, you should never take library design advice from anyone who hasn't had to make a living selling a library in a competitive arena, okay? So somebody who's, who doesn't design libraries for a living, ignore their advice entirely. Somebody who designs libraries, but people are forced to use them. So let's say you're the people who maintain Vulcan. Not interesting. Because unless the, a, a programmer has a choice to pay you or not, you probably don't know what you're doing. Because you have to figure out, like, when your paycheck is, is basically hinges on whether you can deliver something people can actually use and want to use enough to hand you their money, you probably don't know what you're talking about. Because you learn so much from that that you would never learn otherwise, right? <laughs> So here's what I learned from, from this process. First of all, we always did provide source code at RAD to Granny. So when you bought it, um, you could download the source code. So if someone wanted to modify it, they could. Nobody ever does that. Very, very rare. Why? The reason people are using a library is one of two things. Either they want to save themselves the time, or they don't know how to do it. Very often, it's the second one, right? If I'm licensing a character animation library, one of the biggest reasons I might do that is because I don't know how to write character animation code. So typically, what you end up with is a situation where if your answer to how do I solve problem X is go change the source code, right? You're dead in the water. So if you look at the kinds of things that object-oriented programming does, a lot of times they're like, well, oh, you'll just, you know, subclass this thing or make your own class that inherits from blah, or like their answers to how you solve problems are ridiculous in that <laughs> scenario. The user doesn't want to implement more stuff in the character animation library. They want the character animation model to just have what they need, right? And so this idea that the way that you do things is like, well, I don't really know what the vertices are going to be. I call a function and pass it a buffer and it puts the vertices in there, right? Those sorts of things don't fly. The person needs to be able to know, how do I just access this piece of information directly without having to go through your thing to do it because that's too slow or it's putting it in the wrong format or whatever else is happening. They just want to be able to interact with the thing directly and make exactly the thing that they want, right? So what we did for two was completely different. We just said, all right, 100% is exposed. So we're just gonna say, here are the data types. This is what we work with. And this is again, crucial. It's a crucial aspect of library design. Your goal is not to hide everything. It's for you to do the work upfront to figure out what you can promise and then promise that. <laughs> that is what makes a library good. If you can go, here are the correct fundamental building blocks, and I'm so sure that I'm going to expose those to you so that you can use them, and I'm never going to change them on you, right? That's when you know you did your job correctly. The other thing, which is object-oriented, I don't know, it's going to change at any time. Who knows what this thing does? That's really just putting a giant sign on your forehead saying you don't actually know how to solve the problem. Because if you did, you wouldn't have to give me that wish wishy wash your answer, right? You would know what the right way to do this thing is, and you would be shipping me that. So what we did in two is we said, all right, we're going to nail, we're going to get this stuff right. Here's how these things should be done. Here's how these things should be done. And we're going to expose those. When we say we're going to build a transform hierarchy, it comes out in this format to you. And we've got optimized routines to work with it, and you can interact with it directly. You don't have to ask us permission. We don't count on it being anything in particular, right? We're going to do all this stuff. Anything that we can't guarantee, it's all going to be flexible. You hand us what vertex format you want, and we will work with that vertex format, not the other way around, right? Again, none of this object-oriented stuff. You don't, we don't hide what the vertex formats are. If we can't guarantee one particular vertex format is correct, we will just work with all of them. And we wrote fast routines to deal with that kind of stuff, right? And, uh, 
you know, completely unsurprisingly, this product was like a massive success. Like we had hardly anybody use Granny One. It was in like 10, 20 people. Uh, I don't even know what the number of SKUs is for Granny, but it's like in the thousands. Like, and again, it was just because we just gave them the tools they actually needed. And the funniest part about it, there was one place. I just wasn't good enough at the time is really what it was. There's one place in Granny where we didn't do that. It was the control system, the thing that does the animation updating. Looking back at it now, having had everything from then, I mean, this is like 2002, 2001 or something when this stuff is all happening, 2000, somewhere around there, millennium, turn of millennium. Um, having had the next 20 plus years to learn from the, that lesson of no, 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 solving a programming problem means you know what it's doing, not you don't right? Um, I now look back on this part of the code and go like, it would have been so simple to do it the right way. Like, I just know intuitively what the right is. But, but at the time, this was all new to me, right? Because we hadn't really thought it through. And it was me and Jeff Roberts who did a lot of this work to try and figure out how, how are we going to make a library that did this? Because they'd already done it for things like video, but video is much simpler uh, in terms of what it, how it interfaces. A video, you just kind of expect to get some color planes back or something. Like, there's not really this tight integration like there's with character animation. Characters, you know, all these things like, oh, I need to IK adjust that thing or I need to know where the hand is. Uh, you know, there's all this stuff that's much more, into, it's like there's a lot more integration. It's a much harder problem for library design. It's not a harder problem for implementation necessarily because video codecs are very hard to make. So it's not really like that the product is harder, but the interface, like the library boundary layer is much harder. I would say character animation is like one of the harder things you could try to do. So it's very difficult. Um, anyway, one section of the code did not work this way. And I think it's the worst part of the product by far. Um, I mean, I don't think this product is still so, I mean, I, I think you can still technically get it because there's still some people who rely on like the export. Like you make stuff like this, it hangs around forever, right? It's just like COBOL or something. It's like... <laughs> Could anyone start a product using Granny today? No. I don't even know if they sell it it's to new hidden. customers. It's hidden on the website. It's hidden. But it's you just don't... like, is someone still using it? Yes. Because there's some pipeline somewhere. It's just some legacy thing, and it's still in there, right? But in general, not being used. But if you were looking at it today, right, most of the things make sense. Mostly it's just missing things that we would want added, right, because it hasn't been updated to the new stuff. Uh, that you would want to do in character animation, and also most people now they just use Unreal Engine, yeah. right? They really use Unreal Engine, so we don't we're not going to license characters because it's already got that, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, so what happens is if you look at um, uh, if you look at the the system, most of it is done in this correct way that I think is still pretty good. I'm sure I would fix a bunch of things, right? Like I'd improve them, but most of the things are pretty good. The thing that, that's really bad is the control system. And the reason is because it's still sort of object-oriented. It was the system where you didn't really know exactly how things were being done under the hood. There's just a central thing where you say, update the time of this you know, set of things to this time. And it redoes the animation for you. It, it redoes what the state of the animation should be at that time, right? Terrible <laughs> idea, absolutely <laughs> awful. Um, and so that part, was not only the worst part, it made the program less useful by far, it is also the only source of a really, our, we never really had a really bad bug that we shipped to end users, except in that. And the reason there was a very bad bug, uh, I can tell this story now, because I think everyone involved is, is gone. <laughs> <laughs> the reason we had a really bad bug was, was as follows. There was a company that was using it, and they were really pushing the stuff that they wanted to do with character animation. And because they were on like an Xbox at the time, which was very constrained in terms of memory, they didn't have enough memory to store the control structures they were using. They needed a way to keep them smaller. So they asked me for a way to like recycle these things. And I added a little kind of secret part just for them, right? And that thing had a bug in it because it wasn't really part of the things we normally tested. And it was just kind of added to like help them do this thing. And that was the nastiest bug we ever had. Eventually did get found, but it was like a super bad bug that was really hard to find. And so not only was that the source of like, not only was that 
that sucked. But the only, like, if the system had just been designed correctly in the first place, they never would have asked for that feature, right? So the, the fact that I had to add that at all, and then I had to add it quickly, and then it had this bug because it wasn't, had the, didn't have the proper attention paid to it, all of those things, um, because again, like, we had testing for a lot of our stuff too, right? And that didn't have it, right? So it's like, it was this rush thing that didn't have the proper testing and like, all this stuff, right? None of that would have happened because the only reason we had to add that was because it was following that crappy object-oriented model. If it had just been done correctly in the first place where you could individually uh, micromanage when those things were updated, never would have been a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the anyway, so for me, the jury, it could not be clearer how bad object-oriented programming is. Just <laughs> never do it. Um, the things that people ever originally thought to do it for, there's like two branches of that. And at some point, like I probably make a video just talking his, about historically how object training program went, went wrong, because it did. Um, but it is the end result of all of it is just like, look, the only part of object oriented programming that even makes any sense at all is to just think of it as API boundaries. And you don't need to think about objects at all. You just need to think about sometimes we want to break a system apart because of Conway's law or our brains can't think of the whole thing. The goal there is just figure out what the right primitives are that people use across that boundary. That is what your job is. Don't think about objects. Don't think about associating. The idea of associating a method with data, don't ever think about that. It's always bad. Never think that way. It's always wrong. Get rid of all that stuff. And the good thing that you would ever get out of object training programming, which is the ability to substitute things, it's about that API boundary. Make that correct, and then you can substitute things out around on either side of the boundary. That's good. That's not object oriented. Just call an API. We've had it forever, right? It doesn't have anything to do with objects. <laughs> it has to do with libraries or components, right? And we would never call those objects in the modern sense because we've been taught that objects are these small things where the methods and the data are like coupled and the data is tiny. It's like, no, 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 no. The only time you should be coupling interactions and like methods and data is big. It should encompass hundreds of structs, right? Not one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, so all that stuff I felt was a really great learning experience. It's, it's the most I've ever learned anywhere was working at RAD. And I probably would be a really crappy programmer today if I hadn't gone there. That'd be, that's my guess. I was I was reading about from I think on the website of Rad Gain Tools that he, there was like a small group of programmers at Rad and they were all of you were involved also in a customer experience kind of proper process. Yes. Can you yes. tell me a little bit more how Rad was structured, how you were working there? Uh, sure. So essentially the way it was working when I arrived is a little different from how it worked at the end when they got acquired by Epic. So they did get a little bit bigger over time. When I arrived there, I was the third programmer for three projects. So there was Jeff and he did the video codec. There was John and he did the audio system and there was me and I did the character animation library. Okay. And that's what we had. Three <laughs> products, three programmers, right? Okay. Uh, later, we added the mics, Mike Abrash and Mike Sarton, who did uh, a thing called Pixomatic, which then ended up being used as the driver for Intel's Larrabee project, which was this chip they were doing for, they were going to do it as a graphics card. Uh, so that was two people on one product, and that product was called Pixomatic. It was a software renderer. Um, and then I guess mm, in order, from there it becomes a little bit tricky. John Miles left the company eventually to go do his own thing. Dan Thompson was hired to replace him doing the Milestown system, which he still does to this day, although I think now he's kind of mostly doing Unreal Engine maintenance stuff. Um, Probably no one's ever heard of him, but he's really good. He's he's very good at these kind of large, like dealing with large systems and just being okay with that. Uh, so yeah, he's he's, I think probably mostly now working on like stuff in the in the Unreal Engine. Uh, and then eventually, 
uh, there's some other programs going around. Charles Bloom and Fabian Giesen both came on at separate times for separate reasons, but ended up being incredibly important for one of Rad's most popular, most widespread products that people may never have heard of, but is now incredibly important. And that's a thing called Oodle. Yeah. So what happened was somewhere, and I wasn't involved with this at all because I'm gone by now. Like, I'm not working at Rad anymore. Uh, Fabian and Charles were there before, like, uh, Charles was there and Fabian was just arriving by the time I was sort of not there anymore. But what happened with them was they uh, ended up working on this sort of new compression technology that was fairly revolutionary. Like, most people didn't really think there was that much mileage left to get in compression uh, because they were mostly just thinking about compression sizes rather than speeds. And they basically figured out ways to get, you know, the kinds of speeds you expect out of crappy compression from really good compression, right? And this became so important that it's now in the PlayStation yeah. hardware. PS5, right? Five, right? Um, so it's got dedicated hardware for this thing. Uh, which I'm probably not allowed to talk about, but it wouldn't matter because I don't know that much about it anyway. <laughs> I, you know, I I wasn't there at the time, uh, but if I did know something, I couldn't say, right? Because uh, hardware stuff is always way more secret than software, right? Um, so anyway, they did some really amazing work on that, both theoretical work and practical work, uh, and that was pretty uh, pretty amazing stuff as well. So they are kind of we're doing some slightly different stuff, you could say. Like, that was a lot of, like, research experimentation kind of work, which is very different than, like, what I did, which was mostly just about production, right? Like, we didn't invent much in the way of of tech. I mean, I guess we did the quaternion linear blending, multi-way linear blend. It's kind of our invention. I don't think anyone had done that before. Uh, and we shipped a library to doing it in 1999, which is, I mean, I don't think anyone had anything like that at the time. So we did a little bit on Granny that was new. Um, and our curve solver is pretty new, uh, but it wasn't new in the way that the stuff that they did was new. Like, stuff that they did is new is kind of like, okay, this is just a new direction for compression that no one ever really did before. And it's kind of amazing, right? So uh, they did, that was kind of a slightly different. And there's also uh, a fellow named Drew Card, who, um, which is uh, amusingly a name that is also a, a sentence, sort of. Uh, or not, or at least a phrase. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so there was a time there was a there was a fellow named Brian Hook, and Rad bought a thing called telemetry, uh, which was this sort of uh, profiler. They're very common today. Like you see them. Like there's things like uh, superliminal and uh, and it's a name. There's a there's an open source one. Oh crap. There's an open source one that's like Superliminal, and, and its name is escaping me. It's like Trace Tracy, Tracy. Okay. Okay. I think it's called Tracy. Let me say, um, they're they're much more common now. At the time, this was kind of a little bit rare. It was a product called Dress Code, which was one of these things. Rad bought this product called Dress Code. Brian Hook uh, maintained it for a little while, and they changed the, the name. They changed the name when Rad shipped it to Telemetry. Drew Card, Brian Hook left, Drew Card came on and maintained Telemetry Out, and Telemetry still exists to this day. It's used inside Epic now. You can still buy it, I think, but it's it's now integrated with Unreal Engine, I think, as well. And it's basically just an integrated profiler for Epic products, and you, know, you can see flame graphs and who's doing what and kernel time transitions and GPU usage and all that stuff. Um, and that's basically how RAD worked, was that setup. Anyone who is in charge of a product, such as me for the character animation, the support comes to me first. So, like, directly to me. So a customer has a problem, I get the email. Such and such doesn't work. This export's broken. Uh, this thing's crashing. Whatever it is, no matter how severe or unsevere the bug is, comes directly to me first. And that was Jeff's just, like, kind of mandate. He's like, if you're in charge of the product... They're very generous with payment at Rad. You got royalties on your stuff. It was like a very good company to work for. And Jeff is the best boss you'd ever have. Like, there are no better bosses than Jeff. And it was a very generous company to work for. They didn't hoard the money. Like, they shared it with the people who were making it work. But the flip side of that is you had to take ownership of the customer experience. So you were the front line for everything. And while annoying, believe me, it's really annoying, 
uh, it is there's a there's a method to that madness, which is just that if you're the one yeah. who's yeah, getting the exactly. bugs all the time, you will fix the things in the product that are generating those bugs, yeah. right? Because now it's you want to be able to reply with a one sentence reply that's like tick this checkbox. You don't want to have to go hmm I don't know what this bug is. Let me go look at the thing, right? You'll add the logging that you need. You'll fix the things that are confusing. You'll add a checkbox for things that are complicated. And it really does make the product work better because there isn't a layer of insulation between you. You know, like if this happened at Adobe, some of their products might be usable by now, right? <laughs> Instead, you've got, I mean, like, like you've got products like After Effects that have been around for decades that can't like resize multiple things without parenting them to a null node first. And you're just like, how is this possible? How it's possible? None of the programs have to fix any of the bugs. They don't have to add any of the features. They just they they are insulated from how bad this product is. But right? also you were you were like so, almost alone on this product, making it happen. So all of it yeah. was in your head and you could map this and in Adobe's products and pretty much every ad product, it's like hundreds of others and they all know just like the tiny slice. And this was, this is what I find like super extremely exciting about Rad that like you could steer the pro project, but there must have been like times where you consult, for example, for in the case of like developing an algorithm or something like that with other programmers, right? Yeah. I mean, on the Adobe front, just to finish that off, it's like, yes, I agree. But that just means you need one other person at that company who is person in charge of forwarding the bug report to the person responsible for that section. And then we're done. It still should be that way. Like they should all have to suffer through whoever is the person who refuses to fix the resizing in that program should be getting the hundred emails a day from customers going, how do I resize multiple things instead of someone on a forum somewhere who is not even employed by Adobe answering, parent them to a null first, resize them and unparent, right? They should have to eat that dog food so that they will make it into a steak instead of this minced, you know, whatever that they're serving. Um, but yeah, at Rad, uh, so uh, to give you an example of the thing that you're suggesting, so Granny uh, as a product shipped with some things that I didn't write. Jeff, because he was a compression person, he, he's the one who does the video codec, so he's into compression. You couldn't ship a video codec if you didn't like compression, right? Because that's it's all about that. Both lossy and lossless are both involved a lot, uh, and so you kind of have that whole thing. And uh, he wrote the... Uh, texture compressor. So Granny came with a texture compressor. You could store it would store your textures much smaller than they were, and then blow them back out at runtime. You know when you loaded them into usable textures. And uh, he wrote that, and he wrote a compressor for like the files in general. So like the vertex data and that and the markup and bone data and animation curves. He wrote things that would compress that as like a lossless compressor, kind of like, you know, a, an LZ style thing, right? And so there were entire parts of Granny that I didn't write. Not much because most of it was just the character animation stuff, which I was responsible for. But the things that were compression, I didn't do anything. I just basically took code from him and put in the necessary like structure to call it on at the times when it needed to be called. And so there definitely is cross pollination there. Like if someone else has a skill and they can make this thing and you don't really know how to do it, uh, that definitely happened. Another example of that, I uh, this is much more limited, but I'm having trouble remember exactly what it was, but it was something like this. There were as a time when uh, SSE was sort of first being available more widespread. So most of the time, uh, everything's scalar that we're shipping this stuff. There's no vector units in the processors. MMX happens, not that useful for 3D. SSE happens, that is kind of useful for 3D because now you can do four wide float computations. Um, so the four wide float, I shouldn't, I'm, I'm just in case anyone doesn't know, I, I don't want to say something that might be misleading people who've never heard of these things. MMX, when I say it's not useful for 3D, I don't mean it's not useful for 3D entirely it would be good for doing things like 3D uh, blending or rasterization. It's not good for vertex transform and lighting because it's not float. So SSE is the first time it's float. So the things that Granny does, because remember this is the era where hardware wasn't doing transform and lighting. Oftentimes you still were. Or if it is doing transform and lighting, 
it's not doing vertex blending. Or if it is doing vertex blending, it's not doing vertex morphic. Like, so it kept being like, there are these things you still did in software sometimes because the hardware couldn't quite do it. Nowadays, you would never do any of this stuff on the software side. It's all going to be done on the hardware side, obviously, but that wasn't the case. Um, so anyway, that sort of stuff, bone transforms, vertex transforms, things like that. At one point, Mike Sarton wrote some SSE optimized code for things like matrix transforms. So that was another case where somebody else wrote some things that I then imported into Granny and used. Obviously, we all talk to each other. So if I was having trouble figuring something out, I might talk to Jeff. And when we were de developing the API and like working towards how do we make something this complicated, easy for people to integrate, a lot of that was back and forth with Jeff. Like, what if we do this? What if we do that? Like, let's try this. Let's try that, right? Um, and we would make trade-offs because there are some cases like in Granny where we picked something that we knew wasn't quite the right answer for performance, but was better for usability. And some of those trade-offs are really hard to make. And we did some of that um, with the stuff on Granny as well. And, you know, like, so it's a whole okay. other thing we could go down if you wanted to, but that's, yeah. Okay, okay. And, you know, for the methodology, because you were doing pretty much whole Granny 1 and then Granny 2, and I think some work on Bing as well, right? Yes. Uh, did you want me to elaborate on the Bing stuff or? Let, let's keep it. Uh, let's wait uh, for the Bing stuff. I was just wanting to ask you, in terms of methodology, you have this quite large project, Granny 2, for example. You know what it's supposed to do, but there's a lot of stuff to get there. Have you tried... Uh, either like scrum methodology with like doing some sprints and like doing some stuff with like uh, doing like tasks and like, a ha or was it like, okay, let me just lock myself up in the basement for two months, do this stuff like 60% and then go back and just do the 40% with like API and stuff. Like, ha how did you tackle this? Because it's, I think it's an important part of the software development in general. Like if you split it very tiny in the tiny bit, bits, you start to lose track what happens in, in, in larger, larger shape, like larger project. Yes. Um, so I guess what I would say is I don't have a lot of experience with formal management methods like waterfall and agile and these terms that they use. I, vaguely know what they're talking about, but I don't have much experience with them because uh, I I imagine they kind of make more sense when you're trying to, well, to the extent that they make sense at all. I mean, I'm, I don't know if they make sense or not. There's people who think they suck. There's people who think they're great. I, I have no dog in that fight or whatever the term is, right? I don't know why we're dog fighting now, but um, it's kind of a horrible practice. But separately from that, um, maybe it's a horrible practice. Maybe management is also a horrible practice. <laughs> dog that, right? Is the correct term. Either way, what I would say is I don't have a lot of experience with those formal methods. So I'm not really in a position to comment much on that. I can tell you how these products were developed. And you would kind of have to maybe someone who is interested in formalizing methods like this. I'm not, uh, I'm not one of those people who's just like, you sit down and write the code and it's done. Like, uh, I appreciate the fact that like there are coordination issues and there's team scaling issues and all that sort of stuff. So I'm not like one of these people who just, you just write the code. Uh, but I'm not really capable of mapping it onto a bigger organizational structure with all of the sort of things you would have to assume, like some of the programmers suck and some of the managers are idiots and like all the things that actually happen where it's like, this method can't just be about great people getting work done because that's not what the reality is at a Fortune 500 com company or whatever, right? So I'll let that to other people and I'll just kind of tell you roughly this is how it works. So one of the nice things with uh, something like Rad is Jeff really knows what he's doing. And he kind of has an intuitive sense for these things in a way that probably makes certain aspects of formalistic management less important for if you have sort of relatively high productivity programmers who are taking direction from him. So when I first got to Rad, he gave me the very best direction you could possibly give someone at the time, which was, I don't really care what you give me. 
just give me something by the end of the year that's this product. <laughs> right? Okay. That's a long, long um, term. He was just like, just do something. And then we'll revisit it from there, right? Um, and this is a brilliant idea because it's like, look, if you told me like, you know, customers have to be able to do this and worry about that and make sure you do that, right? He's like, he knew that like, we didn't have enough experience with this product. And, I'm a re- and I don't have any experience shipping libraries because I've never done it before. He just kind of knew it's like, don't try. Like, we don't, we don't need this thing to be successful right out of the gate. We got plenty of time. Do something that has the stuff working in it. Just get anything done. And then we're going to revisit it, right? He's like, we're not, in his mind, it's like, we're not going to win anything on version one. And he was right about that, but possibly because he gave that direction. I mean, who knows? But I think it was right either way. And that's exactly what we do. It's like a couple months. And I did the first version, right? And uh, that, I think, is a really brilliant way to start a product. It's like, look, and people even have this term in a different way. They call it MVP, minimum viable product. Yeah. Like, just something. If this thing is supposed to be a taxi service, you know, your Uber, it's like, just get something that hails the taxi, right? And I think that's totally reasonable. Um, I don't like the fact that now, because of the investment culture, rather than at RAD, which means we just have a few beta customers who then try that thing out, and we're expecting to do major upgrades to it. In the internet world, it's like, and then we're going to IPO, right? It's like, we shoveled out the MVP. It performs horribly and doesn't do most of the things we wanted. But we're just trying to get to our our uh, public offering as fast as possible. So we're not going to fix any of it, right? Um, so, there, you know, I, I would probably part ways with them at that part. But I appreciate the um, the MVP part of things. Because I'm like, yes, that's a pretty good idea. Because if you don't have experience with this thing, you don't really know what the boundaries are, what you're doing. So doing internal, you know, I would prefer it to be kind of thought of as a prototype, perhaps. But treating it as production has some benefits, which is that people have to actually do it. They can't just be like, oh, it's the prototype, so it doesn't support the back button. It's like, no, it has to support the back button because it's really going to actually go out to some users, right? But not very many. So I'm actually okay with that as long as you have some idea what you're doing. So we did that. And then from there, it was more about, let's look at what is not working and let's figure out how to do that part better, right? So typically what was happening during this time period is I'd look at things and I'd try to go, uh, okay, how can we do something better here? And at first I tried to do that in the object-oriented way, right? I talked about the switch and it never got any better. All I was doing was moving things around inside objects and it never got better. And then finally we kind of took that step to move past that and it got dramatically better. So There was a little bit of time after that first initial run of just here's the first thing we thought of, of trying to make an object in one that worked. And it was just me sitting down and experimenting. There wasn't a scrum board or anything like that. Um, It was just me going like, what could I do here? And it just didn't work out. So there's a certain amount of experimentation and it doesn't work. Then once we sort of went like, okay, we have to move past that. Then the process changed a little bit because we started to have traction. See like, oh, this looks like it's going to kind of work. Once you see the thing that's going to kind of work, I started to build up an idea of how do I replicate that thing across the product? And it became more of a direct march towards finishing. It was like, okay, that's how this should be done. How do I, I then have to go do that for the bone system. I have to do that for the texture system. I have to do that for this. I would just march through them one after the other doing them, right? And so... So that process was really more of a experimenting to find out how we were going to fix our core problem, which turned out to just be, boop, sucks. But but saying it sucks is one thing. How do we deliver the non-oop version that's actually good? Because, you, I mean, everyone's used crappy non-oop code. So just because you're not using oop doesn't mean the code's any good. Once we had that paradigm and there were a bunch of things that was like only experimentation we're really going to reveal, then how do we replicate it? And then it's just a market. Replicate it, replicate it, replicate it to every part of the product. And then that's what we shipped. Um, and like I said, unfortunately, one I didn't, for some reason, my brain just couldn't wrap its head around how to replicate that idea for the control structure area. It's obvious how you do it in hindsight. So I, I can't, there's no way for me to say why I was too dumb to do that, right? Because it was obviously just a, a brain gap that I just don't have anymore. 
but what that was, I don't know. So there, I replicated that design methodology to basically everything in the product except that part, and that part sucked. Um, from there, once you have that, once we have Granny 2 out, then it's more of just a maintenance mode. Every month, I would look at the sorts of things that weren't very good in the product. Uh, people don't like this part. This part's too slow. Uh, there's too much bone wiggle in this kind of animation fitting. Uh, there's this, there's that, right? How do we fix blah? Root motion was always a problem. How do we get root motion to be better? Uh, and you just spend some time trying to fix that. And then a lot of your time is just what do customers say? Customers are reporting bugs, you got to fix the bugs. Customers are having trouble exporting blah, you got to fix blah. Everyone wants LightWave, got to go write a LightWave exporter. So at that point, your scrum board that has stuff on it is your inbox. It's just what are the things that I don't have an answer for when customers are emailing me? Well, if I have time today, that's what I'm going to look at. Um, and so that tends to be another benefit of of Jeff's method there, right? Yeah, Jeff, of, Jeff, right? Jeff, yeah. Jeff, Jeff's method seems to be great that he was allowing the time for the prototype, for the MVP, and then to pretty much redo the entire product. Because like you can probably imagine that most companies would make this first version and then there will be like six product managers that will be like let's add this feature let's add yeah, this feature yeah. and there would be no time yeah. to do this again so like in hindsight i think jeff knew what he was doing <laughs> pretty well he he has a very good uh he he's very good at managing uh programmers and you know that's why i say like if you were then like, well, how do you replicate the rad style out to a larger company? The answer is, I don't know that, like you would have to do a lot of work to figure out how you would do that because what you're looking to do at that point is replace a sort of magic bullet, which is just Jeff's intuition and his experience. You're trying to replicate that into a process. And it might be possible to do that, but it's hard, right? Whereas if you just have a Jeff around, then you just kind of get that for free <laughs> for all the programmers who work well with him. Like some people don't work well with him and then it's not going to work. But for all the programmers who work well with him, it's just, it just works, right? And so trying to turn that into a process, would it look like Agile? Would it look like Waterfall? Would it look like this? Would it look like that? No, it would probably be a departure from some of these things in important ways. But what are those ways? I don't know. And not being a manager myself, I don't have a lot of um, opinions about that. Like I wouldn't, if someone was like, we want to move away from agile to something better. Casey, what is it? I'm like, not my domain. dude. <laughs> I got no idea. Right. Ask someone else, ask a manager. I like to program. I don't want to manage. It's not something I look forward to doing ever. So uh, I don't have much to say about that other than I really enjoyed my time at rad and Jeff's an amazing manager. That's about it. Uh, when you are doing the switch from OOP to OOP less code from Granny mm -hmm. 1 to Granny 2, how did you learn the, the other way? Like, was it just reading the code of the coworkers from Jeff and John or like, was there like, did they coach you or like, how did you get that? Um, I don't really think there was, <clears throat> so I guess what I would say is I think one thing that might happen, I'll, I'll give you a hypothesis of something that I, it's, I think what probably happened to me, but it may, and it may or may not be something that happens to other people as well. And that is, I think one reason that people think things like inheritance hierarchies work or are good is because you learn them. You can't really start using an inheritance hierarchy if you don't know how to type in like, an expression because there's no code to put in a hierarchy, right? So you're going to sort of learn something about programming before you really are making your own inheritance hierarchies for real. You might be using toy ones or something, but you're not really programming. So I think most people start doing like inheritance hierarchy things, especially at that time, they have been programming in C or some other procedural way for a while. 
but they're not that good at structuring their code. Object-oriented gives them a way to start structuring their code that just happens to be bad, but it is a way of structuring their code. And they then get in the habit of structuring their code more. Like they spend more time thinking about how to organize their code. My argument is they're spending it doing bad organization of the code, but they are spending more time because there's one thing that object-oriented programming will do is divert a lot of your programming time towards organization right? Because there's tons of rules and tons of different things you can do to do that and all this other stuff. So I think one thing that happens is you then think, oh, well, this is good because my code is more organized now and you're not necessarily wrong. But if you then just say, I'm not going to use any of these oop things anymore, your brain still remembers a bunch of stuff about, oh, I like to organize things now. So I'm going to want to like think about how to keep these things from arbitrarily intermixing, and I might take time to separate two things out because I've been told to do that in object-oriented. Now that I'm not doing it, I will do that with functions sometimes and other things like that. And you'll find that you actually do procedural code really good, almost automatically, <laughs> right? And so that's sort of what happened. It was like, oh, I'm much better now than I was when I went into object-oriented programming, right? Not necessarily because of object-oriented, but because I was focused on code organization for a while. And just because the things I was trying to organize my code into were bad, it still built up a part of my brain that's thinking about organization. So all I really had to do was change that to be targeting something else. Instead of targeting breaking things up into small pieces of data with associated members, it was how do I break it up into small pieces of data with external functions that work across multiple pieces of data. Just straightforward procedural stuff. It's not that complicated. And my brain just did it. Were Obviously you, just... Were you fighting the urge of doing like, for example, encapsulation or something like that? Not really, because you still... I mean, one of the nice things about procedural is it's just a superset, right? If you want to have a function that only operates on one struct, well, that's object-oriented, isn't it, right? I mean, it's like it's, you could think of that as being encapsulated <laughs> in some way. Now, it's not getting ridiculous. It's not doing some of the worst stuff, which is like, oh, and anything that inherits from this because I made it a virtual function or something. Like, you could make it icky if you want to. But you can still have things encapsulated as much as you want by just saying, here's a set of functions that only operate on the struct. That's pretty encapsulated. It's not, you know going maybe as far as some OOP proponents would want you to by making it a virtual dispatch or something like that, but it's still something like that. So rarely do you have to fight the urge really all that much. All you have to do is just give yourself the option, like if something is better expressed as operating across objects, don't you don't have to think about associating it with anyone, right? Just stop yeah. thinking about that, and all of a sudden all your code gets much better. It's very easy to unlearn these bad habits. Just stop thinking about X and you're good. Right. Um, so I found that it was actually pretty easy and it's just very freeing. And anything that you found that you liked in object oriented programming, just keep it. <laughs> just don't think of it as a force. Don't think of it as you have to do this um, because some weird person who wrote a book told you to. Right. Just forget that. If you find that you still want something very tightly coupled to this particular data type, then it is. It's fine. It works just fine in procedural, right? It doesn't need to be yeah. a member. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's turn into, let's turn to uh, Bing. Uh, you're working on Bing 1. I never worked on Bing 1. So the only thing that of mine that you would see in Bing 1 is when I went to RAD, they didn't have a system for producing documentation, really. The documentation was written in a Word file or something. I don't know. Jeff, like, literally shipped just, like, a doc. <laughs> and, <clears throat> you know, uh, there was no online documentation. You couldn't go on yeah. the web, yeah. uh, right, or anything. Um, and so uh, he was literally just shipping, like, a printed manual. And when I say shipping a printed manual, I don't mean he was shipping a Word file. I mean it went out in a three-ring binder. Okay. Roughly so when many... I got there, I'm like, oh, that's ridiculous. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. So uh, <laughs> I did a bunch of things when I went to RAD that were just like process modernization. I made a document tool 
because nothing existed at that time. There's no Doxygen, there's none of that stuff, right? So I made a document tool that basically reads these input formats and produced a LaTeX file so that you could run it into PDF because Jeff still wanted printed manuals. Who knows why? He just was like, I don't know, we should print the manuals. So that was still there. Jeff is very forward thinking on many things. Docs weren't one of them. Um, <clears throat> so I made that and I uh, and it would produce a CHM file, the old Windows help file format. So you could use uh, online, like an online help. You could open up a little CHM file oh, and type in oh, yeah, anything that, yeah. you wanted and it would jump right to it. Um, it's way better than help on, on the internet. Let me tell you that right now. Um, so I made a, a thing that did that. And uh, I made a uh, a program that would serve our files to customers because they also had no way of delivering updates to customers without mailing them a CD, right? Okay. Um, so I had to mail a CD or sometimes they would try to use email <laughs> to okay. send it. So it's really backwards in 1999 when I went there, right? So I made a program that would sit uh, uh, like with an FTP server and our sales guy, Mitch Sewell, he could go in uh, to the database that they use for customer relations management. And there's just a button like, give this person access to this for a week or give this person access to this for a year. And the I wrote a little program that would just automatically give those people FTP access. So they would just have the updates. Whenever we put them up, they just get them, right? They could just go get the new one. So I did some modernization stuff and all of that was used in Bing. So uh, you got your Bing updates through my code. You got your Bing docs. Those were through my code. So I did contribute to the project I didn't have anything to do with the program. So none of it was, I didn't have anything to do with it. It was just, Jeff was, did all of that. And I don't think I contributed at all. Uh, certainly no code, uh, I don't think. Okay. And so Bink the too? only time, yeah, yeah, the only time I worked on Bink was Bink 2. Uh, and the reason for that was because Jeff uh, kind of was overworked at the time. So he was working on Bink 2. And he didn't really have time to get it done in time for some pretty major customer things where they needed it, basically. So Bink 1, let me just tell you a little bit something about the architecture of Bink or like what it's trying to do. So a normal video codec, it's mostly concerned with space. So it, or, or I should say like quality space trade-off. So you look at something like MP4, what they're usually talking about, or like, H, I should say H.264, H.265, whatever. What they're mostly concerned about is I want a, a, some dials that I could turn so that if I want this to take up less bandwidth or less space in storage, I turn the dial and the video gets worse and the storage gets less or the bandwidth gets less. Usually they phrase it in terms of bandwidth. Which usually it's still very transmission oriented in their world uh, about like broadcast bandwidth and all these sorts of things, right? So, it's, but for video game developers, it's usually more about storage. But bandwidth is important because you like you have to play from a, a DVD. It only has a certain amount of bandwidth. You can't exceed that cap. If you're loading things at the same time, you have to split the amount. Blah blah blah. So uh, at Rad, looking at the design of the codex, it was rarely about that exclusively. That's obviously a knob you do want, but you have another really important constraint, and that is this has to run at 30 frames a second without taking too much CPU because the CPU is going to be doing stuff like background loading. So this thing has to run everywhere, and it has to run efficiently. It can't require hardware like H.264 does, right? It can't do any of that. So Bink 1 was a very conservative uh it, you know, it, it did full, it was a full color codec because remember Smacker was palletized. So full color codec, so it was 24 color, eight bits RGB. And I could also do an alpha plane. Um, but it was very conservative in terms of how much it was trying to do compression. It wasn't trying to do as advanced stuff as something like an H.264. And as a result, the file sizes are larger for the same quality. If you wanted a particular quality, Bink video, file size can be larger. This is not a problem for most people in games because they have plenty of space left over and they're not producing that many cinematics anyway. However, I believe it's Gears of War 3, 2? I can't remember which one. Let's say Gears of War 3, but I don't remember. Some installation of the Gears of War franchise. They want to ship and they have gotten to the point where they have tons of cinematics. 
They make them inside their own tools. So they're really kind of almost in engine cinematics, but they use them to hide load times between levels and things like that. So they can't actually be doing them as actual engine stuff. As disks have gotten faster and like engines have been more powerful in terms of what they can display GPU wise, this becomes less important. But at the time, you didn't really want your cinematics going through it for both reasons. One, you wanted to load stuff in the background. And two, the cinematic might feature more things than you could even fit on the GPU at the time or blah, 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 right? Or the load times to get it all in would have meant there was a loading screen for the cinematic, which you really, you know. <laughs> so there's a bunch of reasons why people don't want to do that at the time. I want to say it's Gears of War 3, but don't quote me on that. It might have been a different Gears of War. You could go look at the timeline of Bink updates and see when Bink was in beta and that whatever gears was around that time, that's which one it would have been. The problem is they want to ship so many cinematics that they don't fit on the number of discs that they need, that they want to ship in the package. So, so the DVDs, it's something like, if we don't get better video compression, we'd have to go to four DVDs or turn the compression rate up so much that our cinematics look utter, like they look like garbage, right? And we don't want to ship that. Because obviously you could ship them with Bink 1, but they'd look awful. Uh, so Jeff is like, crap, I have to get Bink 2 out, in at least as a beta, in time for this gear shipment, because we really we care about Epic as a customer. They rely on our product. They don't really have a lot of other options. Um, and so this is kind of something we need to hit. And he doesn't really have uh, time, he doesn't think, to finish it before then. So the reason I worked on that project was because of that. I came on just as like a second programmer for six months. Might have been 12 months. I don't know what it was. To just do stuff, to try and take stuff off of his plate. So the kind of things I did were like generators for SIMD deblocking filters or MoComp filters, things like that. I made a debugging utility called Mustache for viewing planes and debugging where errors occurred and things like this. So I was basically just doing work necessary to let Jeff ship the beta. And that's what I did. So a lot of my stuff was in that Gears of War beta that ended up shipping with Gears of War. Um, and then eventually, you know, I don't know when, but at some point they went back and for some version of Bink 2, they would have cleaned all that out. So I'm assuming most of my code would now be gone because it was almost all there as just like plugging up holes of like, this probably isn't the best MoComp filter, but Jeff was just like, I don't know, here's a MoComp filter. Just get me some code that does this so we can put it in there. And that's what I did, right? Um, and then later, I think, I, I think they have, you know, when they had more time, they would probably come up with different ideas for what the filter should be. And they probably have better filters now. I don't, don't quote me on that, but stuff like that. So I don't know how much the code is still in there. It might still be in there, but my job wasn't to ship the version of Bink. It was to ship the beta Bink, uh, which we did, and it worked pretty well. Uh, and and that was that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're closing of the rad chapter. Uh, do you have anything to add on top of that? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. And after rad, where where are you headed? To your own stuff? Uh, yeah, after that, I've just always worked on my own stuff. Uh, and I don't know, uh, we always managed to make a living doing that currently, uh, which is still pretty good. I, we don't have a lot of ambition here. <laughs> we just, we just like to do stuff, right? Um, if I'm programming, I'm usually pretty happy. Uh, and so, you know, we kind of do whatever, whatever works. And so we're kind of hoping, we're still hoping we can ship some game stuff. We still like doing that. And, uh, you know, we've contributed to some game projects, but we never done one entirely by ourselves. And we're still kind of hoping that someday we can ship a game entirely by ourselves. It's hard for us because we don't have a designer. It's been a really hard thing. And I'm, I kind of have to, I kind of have to do that role and I don't really know how to do it. So it constantly causes a problem for us. Um, if we had a designer, we probably would have shipped some good games by now, but uh, what can I say? So uh, we're still kind of trying to learn a process that where we can do things that we're happy with. Uh, 
and uh and yeah and i guess coming up on the horizon here for us it's it's going to be a little uncomfortable because we're sort of having to move our like one of the things that makes us a lot of money right now is my programming courses on substack they're on computerenhance.com but that's just a it's just a substack we put we put the stuff up on there and substack is just technologically speaking really rough uh they have a hard time, you know, it's it's funny. I worked on video codecs for a little bit, right? They can't even ship a video playback thing and they're not even shipping the codec. All they have to do is just ship it, you know, HTML embedded, text. but you know, yeah. their servers, I guess, are, they don't have a good, I guess they don't have a good CDN strategy or something. So a lot of our customers complain, um, people in lower places that have lower bandwidth or when they're trying to use it on mobile, they can't watch the videos because they're too laggy, right? Um, and Substack just doesn't have they just don't have a tech story. They just don't. They're not a tech company. So we're kind of looking right now at shipping our own platform for just, just this core stuff because it's our biggest money maker and it allows us the freedom to keep doing what we want to do. So we have to stick with it, but it's getting really hard to stick with it on Substack and it makes it difficult for us to support our customers properly. Uh, and it makes, us, makes it difficult for us to provide some of the educational materials we could otherwise be providing. And so we're kind of looking at shipping something like that, sort of hoping by the end of the year, but I don't know when, because it's a pretty big ask, uh, mostly just because we have to maintain servers now, not something we really wanted to do. So kind of looking at what that's going to entail and picking a route that's comfortable for us for maintaining um, servers like that is not a thing this company was ever supposed to do. Like I said, we're tiny. We never wanted to be big. And so figuring that out, been a challenge. Um, I don't like a lot of the options and it's just been one of those things where going forward, uh, it's a, it's a bit much, but it's easier than game design. So, <laughs> okay. I have a couple of things to say. First of all, computerenhanced.com or as you call it, performance aware programming is an incredible course. And I've been a happy oh. subscriber and I think well, it's like opened and widened my horizons. And <laughs> okay. uh, even though I'm not doing a lot of low level stuff, even though I'm now in the Jai beta of Jonathan Blow language. Oh, cool. And again, this is like whole package Jai language plus unlearning uh, object oriented programming with KC okay. course. This is like, okay. it's ideal. It's great. I've <laughs> learned that uh, I've written the CPU software version, the CPU sort of in the beginning of the course, it was great. And I learned a little bit from the Intel manual. It was tough. <laughs> Reading the manual was tough. And second of all, so computerenhanced.com. That's great. Second of all, who is we when you say we, because like you kind of, I think, I don't know how much you want to make this public because I think you keep this somewhat secret, uh, what you do right now. So if you don't want to do, say a lot about this, we can move on. But I think, uh, if you say we, you might also mention who is we. Uh, sure. So we meaning Molly Rocket, which is just a company which the only two members are me and Anna Redberg, and she's an artist, so she doesn't obviously do programming. Uh, we basically, we're usually pretty happy uh, any day that she gets to make art and I get to make code, right? So <laughs> our main goal is to keep that sort of thing happening. And we do that in a couple of different ways. Um, and uh, it, I guess, one of the reasons we would like to ship game stuff is not actually, like I said, we're not game designers, so it's weird, right? But it's like, we don't know that many things where we can actually, where you can create an income stream from those two things. So it's kind of like, if what you can do is program and make art and you wanna take both of those things and turn them into a product, games <laughs> are one of the only places you can really do that, right? Yeah. Um, because things like, I mean, if you say, well, you could make a movie or something, but it's like, well, the amount of art that's involved in making something like a movie is way too much for one artist. Whereas you can do a small scale game or, you know, but again, problem is no game designer. So one of us has to get good at game design one of these days. If you ever see a game come out from us, what you will know on that day is one of us learned how to do design. <laughs> Even if it's kind of bad, you'll know one of us learned it because we at least learned enough to say that this was how it worked, right? Okay. Um, uh, so uh, we sometimes work with contractors though. 
So we do have, you know, sometimes we might contract with other people to do something. So it won't necessarily always be just us in terms of stuff that you see come out uh, from us, but mostly that's that's all it is. And that's mostly all it's going to be. Like we we are not um, we are not trying to be anything other than that. Like that that's all we we are planning on. And we're just trying to we just try to figure out how to keep the lights on, doing those things the way we want to do them. And if we somehow eventually can't do that, then we'd both get separate jobs doing those things. But that's that's pretty much our 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 only reason for being here, right? And so. Uh, We'll also like this this week we have a video coming out actually where we both worked on it. It's about core types, uh, types of computing cores, and like Anna did a bunch of graphics for it, right? So okay. we we do have some other things where you'll see like okay, it's not a game, but we both worked on this thing. Um, so that sort of stuff, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, then I have a couple of questions listed, and I'd like to uh, ask them. Is that okay? Yes. First of all. Back in the day, I think 2015 or 2016, you've hosted a handmade con, right? Yes. This was an incredible conference. And I keep coming back ah. to the videos with Mike Acton, for example, with Jonathan Blow. You were yes. discussing lots of stuff. Was this, first of all, how this conference came about? And second of all, is this something that might come back in the future? Um, hmm. so the first answer is easy. The second answer is maybe harder. So we'll start the first answer, which is how did it come about? How it came about is, uh, we got screwed by Twitch. <laughs> so, so that's, that's the, that's the completely data free answer. And now I will elaborate on what happened. I was initially when we, uh, op so when Handmade Hero, the show on Twitch came out, it was just a random thing. Like, it was just like, I don't know, we'll just do some programming on this thing, right? Like nobody, there wasn't anything like that on Twitch at the time. There wasn't shows where you watch someone program. That's not a thing. So no one, especially me, had any idea that anyone would watch the show. I figured it would maybe be, my thinking was like, if it ever got somewhere. So if you ever could like actually see the game running, maybe then people would watch it. Obviously, I'm in my head, I'm like, obviously no one's gonna watch you start typing, like a create window into the thing, like that's stupid. But actually there were 800 people day one, which is huge on Twitch at that time. Like the big streamers had only a couple thousand at that time, right? And maybe the biggest of the big had 10K or something, right? So it's like, what, 800? That's insane. So it's a total shock that people were going to watch someone program before there was any, there wasn't a character on the screen or anything, right? So that was a total shock. It was a shock to Twitch as well. They put it on the front page. They're like, this is awesome. Maybe this will be a big thing for us. It never really was. Not us personally, but I just mean coding in general. You look on there and the biggest coding streams still only have a couple thousand. And now Twitch is on to like the people who make them the money are all way over 10,000, right? Um, so... I think watching people code didn't really pan out. It pans out for some of the creators though, because if you have enough subscribers, that's still a living. So some of the people who only have a couple thousand viewers or whatever, that's not the end of the world. You can make a living off of that, um, probably. I mean, I, I can't speak for them, but I think you probably could when you factor in all the other things like putting up YouTube videos and maybe s endorsing things or selling, you know, selling courses. Let's say I could go back on Twitch and promote the course, that would be good, right? So there's there's ways you could make a living out of it is the point. Um, so <clears throat> Twitch was very excited and contacted me directly and they were like, do you want to be a partner and all this other stuff? So that was very good because at that time you couldn't just be a Twitch partner. They had to ask you, you had to, it was direct negotiation and a contract and that sort of stuff. And they sort of suggested to me, one of their episodes that like that they would, broadcast a conference if we did one so i was like okay maybe i should do that because that would be really cool like it would be pretty nice to have a, a tech conference on twitch so i started doing some planning work for it and then i have a conference call with twitch where i'm like okay we want to do this can you come film it and they're like no we we don't we're not really interested in that okay 
So I'm like, could you have told me that before I started doing some work of like figuring out how to do this? So <clears throat> at that point, I was like, well, I might, maybe I'll just do it anyway. And I'll just, you know, yeah. I'll maybe some volunteers will be willing to film it, which turned out they were. And we'll just try to put it up that way. And that was the first handmade con. And it went pretty well. You know, we had a full auditorium for it and people seemed to like it. We did one and two. Two was bigger, had more attendance and more seating and all that stuff. And it was two days as well. The first one was just one day. Um, so it went pretty well, but but it was never my intention. Like it was basically just getting screwed by Twitch. And I don't want to say that too harshly. Like it wasn't like there was malice. Like it wasn't like they were like intentionally trying to screw us. They were trying to help us originally, right? But it was just like, you know, how corporations are, you know, somebody says something, some nobody else agreed with that. So by the time it actually goes to somebody's like, wait, what do you mean we have to pay five thousand dollars to send to someone to record this thing? We don't want to do that. Then it's like, no, right? <laughs> uh, so right, you know, uh so so that's what happened. Okay. Uh, and that's why they occurred. Will it come back in the future? No, uh, probably not. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the things about conferences is that if you look at, like, they don't really make any sense in a modern world. More people will watch this conversation that you and I are doing than would ever be able to even fit in a room uh, even if we rented out like the Paramount, which is like the biggest theater we have here, it's only 2,500 people. And I bet you anything, this video gets 3000 or more views. Like when I tweet about it, that's how many people show up at least to watch one of these things typically, right? When I just look at what those numbers are. So there's just not a lot of point to the conference because really all it does to me anyway, is make it so that it, it's like a hard cost for people to bear. And if they don't bear that cost, they miss out on like some in-person networking or getting to experience something. So in my mind, it's like, if people want to meet up, I don't blame them. I also don't blame them for taking corpo money to go to something like the BDC, because it's basically like getting your corporation to pay for a way for you to network and find a different job. So if you can, if you can sell that to your corp, great, go for it. So I don't blame the attendees, but in terms of like, is this the future of education? A conference is just a bad thing. It's just another way that poor people don't get to experience something, right? And so to me, like, I see it as like, would I go through the trouble um, of actually doing this again myself? No, uh, because I don't think conferences has a have a future as anything other than like, a grift really like they're just a way for <clears throat> they're just a way for things to happen that i don't think are necessarily beneficial and that's not to denigrate anybody's particular conference because a particular conference might be held with the best intentions and done in a very ethical way and all those things but it's just to say like when i conceive of the future I don't really want this idea that there's a $1,500 plane ticket plus hotel bill attached to the average person in Lebanon's ability to attend this educational experience. I want to hear that it costs $9 a month and they get the same thing, right? And so the things that happen, I would rather focus on how do we move the things that you're getting from a conference that you're not getting from the online version how do we replicate those in the online world? And let's go with that. Because that to me, it's more fair. It provides more opportunity. And these aren't hypothetical things to me because one of the things that happened <clears throat> with Handmade Hero that I almost never talk about, but that's something only I have witnessed, right? I originally had my email address was on the website for the first three weeks, four weeks. I got inundated with mail. There was so much mail that I took it off, right? Yeah. Even with it off, I still get people regularly emailing me, telling me how the series like changed their life. And the emails are nuts. They're like, I'm from this country where we don't have anything. And I was poor and I couldn't feed my family. Like, I'm not even making this up. It's insane the things people have written me because i'm not 
I am not doing anything for the world, right? I'm just putting out this stream of programming. And they're like, I watched your series and I learned how to code and I passed this Microsoft test and I got hired. And now I, I emigrated to the US and I have a high paying job. And they're like, you changed my life. Thank you so much. I try not to post stuff about that very often because I think it's a bit too braggy. But when you've read enough of those things, you start to realize that's like, no, actually, most of these things that you people do, like a Microsoft conference is just straight up screwing the third world, right? Like having all of these things where if the more money you have, the more likely you are to access it, or the the if you're already in a job, you can access it the less fair things get. And I'm, I've always been somebody who is more, you know, I, I've never been one of these people who thinks that everybody, the whole system should be about leveling the playing field or anything like that. But I've always felt that everyone should have at least fair access to the things they might need to learn stuff. And Conferences just, I don't see how they work. Even in an ideal world where somehow you paid the airfare for people from yeah. impoverished countries to go there, how many people could fit in the auditorium? How many people could fit in the hotel? There's a limit. We can't serve 100,000 people with a conference, really. Not this kind, right? Yeah. Even the biggest conferences in the world are 150,000 attendants, and that's over four days, so it's really less than that, right? So it's like, we need models that everyone who wants to learn can learn. And you already have enough problems with that as it is because they need access to like a computer at the minimum and those are expensive. So we already have barriers to overcome there to give people who are capable the ability to learn. And I don't know. So overall, it's like there's a lot of grief involved in putting up a conference. I won't okay. even go into all of the things that are bad about running a conference, but it's bad. <laughs> Trust me, it's awful. You don't want to do it. If I thought it was helping people out to do it, I would do it. But I actually believe the opposite, which is I believe that it hurts people because it, it, it further restricts access to important things like networking and education. And conferences try to ameliorate that by giving away 200 tickets or having 200 discussions. That's not enough. It's not enough to pick, right? Like if I can get political for a second, Affirmative action is not a solution. All you did was take a small subset of the people who need access and give it to them. The rest are all screwed. Not to mention the 200 people who didn't get that, who were people who would have paid who can't go. So you screwed one set of people who were people who had means and can't go. It's the same as college admissions. You screwed one set of people and you only opened up access to a very small number of people even as a result. That's not good enough. The future is about providing access to everyone who wants to learn, however many people that is. And it's not enough for it to be 200 people. It's not enough for it to be 2,000 people. It's not enough for it to be 20,000 people. If there are 200,000 people who want to learn, we need to have a way to give it to all of them. And so that's my feeling about conferences. It's not, it's not so much now that I would denigrate them because they're not doing that. It's more that am I willing to go through the grief of putting one on I would have to believe that I was doing something good to do it. And I believe it's the opposite. I believe I'm doing something bad. Does that help? Okay. okay. I was not expecting that. <laughs> okay. I was not expecting that, but that's interesting. I did not see that this way, but I also had the second question. What was the impact of handmade hero on you personally? And we kind of <laughs> started on that <laughs> a little bit. Uh, on this show, there were already three people that were that said that Handmade Hero was what really taught them programming. So it was like 25 episodes so far. So already a yeah. good ratio of people that started doing some work maybe in the engine and realized, well, I think I'm missing something. Went to a series and then spent 30 to 40 episodes, even though you have I think 650 something. There's billions. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> there's a lot. And they're like, always the stories that like, I was following Casey until the point where I felt that I can go on on my own and yes. continue the work. This is always 
always always the case. How have you, first of all, how have you kept up doing this? Because the viewership, I guess, declined after some time, right? It was a big spike. And then how um, have you like continued? I guess I don't know if it ever really declined. My interest in it mostly uh, was more what declined because I found that it was taking way too much mental energy to do. And <clears throat> I don't think it has much, it doesn't have very much value to people after a certain point, like you said. They only really need, like nobody really wants to watch anyone make a game. They just want to learn some basic things. So one of the things that we've been looking at is how to figure out how to provide what people actually wanted from Handmade Hero directly. And that is something that we are still kind of hoping to provide at some point. It's very difficult. It's a very hard problem. But my goal is at some point to completely replace Handmade Hero so it just doesn't, no one needs to watch it. They can just watch this other thing that's geared towards exactly what they want, right? Okay. Um, which is that experience of like, oh, I watched 30 or 40 episodes and now I know what those 30, 40 episodes are all that there are. So they, they, ha they got to watch the whole thing. They didn't have to just watch 30 or 40 episodes out of this longer thing and, and then jump around maybe to get stuff. It's like, no, it's all there. We condense it all down, right? Um, it's a hard thing to capture. But I've done a lot of work over the past couple of years trying to figure out exactly how to do that. And I do think we might be able to. So I'd say like there's a non-zero chance that that will happen. Okay. And this is something separate from Computer Enhance. Computer Enhance was sort of a, a, a check to see if we could start releasing things along the lines I'm talking about using Substack so that we wouldn't have to host our own servers. And the answer was no. <laughs> I uh, so I uh, so yeah um okay so you know it's always <laughs> something uh it's okay. always something okay uh do you play games I do um I guess what I would say is I played a ton of games when I was little like a ton I mean, this was in the era of like rampant piracy where everyone copied like floppy disks and crap like that. And I bought games if I ever had any money. I bought the boxed versions of games as well. And my parents would buy them for me as well as like a gift or whatever. And I played, I mean, I don't want to know how many games, but it would have been probably easily in the hundreds as a child across tons of systems. Commodore 64, Amiga, and PC over the eight, over the years, as well as uh, Atari Twenty Six Hundred, ColecoVision, and that probably is it for home systems. And I, I we never had a Nintendo Entertainment System, but I played it at like friends' house occasionally, right? So I played a lot more games when I was little uh, than I do now, and there's a couple of different reasons for that. One is obviously maybe more busy. Uh, and also, uh, I mean, well, there's a lot of reasons, but I do still play games fairly frequently. And I guess what I would say is my interest in gaming is still there, but I've noticed that I think one of, there was like a downside to, so there's kind of like a, there's kind of like a thing where like people started using engines instead of making engines. And naively, you would think, and I think I probably would even think, had I not experienced it myself, that that's probably just mostly good. Like, it's like, well, you know, if you, if you think about it purely from a, like, separation of labor kind of a thing, there's going to be people who are really good at making engines. And the chances that you will have those people, and also really great game designers, is lower than being able to do both separately, Right. If I'm a great game designer, but I don't know John Carmack, how am I going to make Wolfenstein or whatever, right? I'm not, because he's the only person who can make that at the time. Well, there's maybe a couple other people, right? But it's like mostly just him, and two other guys or whatever. So naively, I think like, okay, so we have Unity and Unreal and these things now. That's probably good. Unity's, I have issues with 
it in terms of the quality of the output of the engine, but that's more, I think it would have been nice if it had better technical underpinnings, right? But that's a different statement than the one I'm about to make about what happened with the enginification of things. It feels like the degree of creativity in games has dropped dramatically since the enginification. I don't know why that is. It may have nothing to do with the enginification. It may have more to do with just the lifetime of games. Could be the engines have nothing to do with that. And it's just the lifetime. But I'll give you an anecdote. I went back uh, uh, two years ago, four years ago. Three, I, you know, and I don't even know when I went back. I went back to my parents' house. I visit them occasionally. They live back in Massachusetts. I went back and the ColecoVision, which is old home console, they, they still have it. And uh, I, I took it out. I sort of tried to get a controller working. Of course, they're so old and broken. A lot of times, like, there's only one controller where all the directions still work. <laughs> Things like this, right? Because the contacts are old and all this other stuff. And I just go through the cartridges. I just start playing the cartridges. Every single game I played was different. And most of them, we don't even have games like them today. Just completely really different. I like playing, I'm like, Venture, Ladybug, Mousetrap, uh, uh, Pepper 2. There's like all this stuff, they're all different. Congo Bongo, like, I'm just taking all the, and then Donkey Kong Jr. Like, all the games, the mechanics are totally different. And nowadays, you buy games. If it's a AAA game, there's only one mechanic. It's you push the move the character with the left stick and you push buttons on the right side to like do some attacks. And there's a giant menu system to do all like, where's the skill tree and learn the new like trying to fight. It's, it's the same game. You, you, can't even, you can't even open a AAA game without five minutes in being told to push some button to crouch in the tall grass to avoid being seen by enemies. Every single one, it doesn't matter which game. They're all the same, right? And so we ended up in this place where big games, like the ones that you would buy in a store, like the old ColecoVision games, they're all the same. You can buy indie games and there are some creative games happening in that space. And I can name certain ones, like, you know, Re Return of the Obra Dinn is an example saying where somebody came up with a like, totally new mechanic, kind of. You could point to things that existed before. I was like, no, this is completely different. And whether you like it or not, doesn't really matter. Yeah, you know, this, it's new, this game was written right? from scratch with, with the engine, so it kind of supports your theory. Uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it's Unity. Really? Right? I think so. Okay. 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 Then um, I'm mistaken. Okay. I think so. Okay. It doesn't really need any engine stuff, right? Because it's just you walk around a 3D environment, so it's the kind of thing you can do in a walking simulator. And they yeah. came up with a good sort of thing to put on top of that, right? So there are times that people are making these really creative new ideas that are interesting to play, right? But most of the time when I boot up a game, it's just a game I already played with a new skin on top, right? And that's wearing on me a bit. So I find that a lot of times now I... I just like my attitude going into games is kind of bad. So I was like, well, I'm just going to play some tonight and they're probably only going to be bad. And then they are right. Um, and by bad, I don't really mean like low quality. Cause that might be true. But there might be high quality, like horizon forbidden West or whatever. Like the quality is incredibly high, but the game is just, there's no game. I've already done all these things. There's nothing I'm going to do in this game. They haven't already done. Right. And so uh, it's like, my brain is getting kind of tired of it. And I wish that I had more things. And part of that might be like better discovery. There's probably some indie games out there right now that we're doing some things that I would find fun and interesting. And I just don't know about them because there's so there's 10,000 games released a year or whatever. How do you yeah. find the good ones, right? Um, <clears throat> but the other problem I think is that like, well, because you don't have to program the game from scratch, you're very likely to make something that's whatever you can do straightforwardly in one of these tools. Like, whatever is the easiest thing to make in Unreal Engine, which is this set of games in some shape, then whatever is the easiest thing to make in Unreal, that's what you're most likely to make because you 
all are starting at this point. So I don't think it was true that all the people who made the ColecoVision cartridges were better game designers. I bet they were worse game designers a lot of times than some of the people making these fairly derivative titles in Unity or something. But because they had to start from nothing, they weren't forced towards what is the easiest thing to make in this already existing tool set, which is walking around a 3D environment and pushing a button to do something, right, or whatever. <clears throat> and so I don't know. I don't know if the engines have to do that or not. I think you obviously can make new experiences in these engines, but I just think maybe people aren't as inclined to do so. Another aspect of it that I'm sure doesn't help, that has nothing to do with engines, is the barrier to entry getting too high. Yes, you don't have to make an engine, but no, you can't get away with the kind of art that you were shipping in ColecoVision. I mean, that's below the, even the acceptable art, pixel art-wise, than that people do now. So a lot of your attention is focused towards sequencing animations and importing sprite sheets, all these things they didn't really have to do because there was very little that they could fit in memory in the first place. So it was, that was not going to be much of it, right? So yes, they had to make the engine. Yes, that was a bunch of work that you don't know how to do because you're using Unity, but also you're having to marshal all of this other stuff that they never had to think about at all, right? Yeah. Um, so yada, 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 right? Have you played Outer Wilds? I tried to. What happened? And, you know, this is another one of my uh, <clears throat> games are wearing on me kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, I played the thing for like 45 minutes and I was still talking to people in the starting area and doing little stuff in the simulator. I'm just like, is there good stuff in this game? People say there is. When I have it, it's still installed on my machine, by the way. I have a note to like go back and spend the five hours it's going to take me to get to the game. But it's like... That's another yeah, thing, and this is, by, by the way, very common. It, out, uh, indie games are not as guilty of this, but AAA games are very guilty of this. There could be some fantastic stuff 12 hours into Assassin's Creed, colon, whichever one you're playing, but you will play four, five, six hours of nothing but basically tutorial to get there, right? That's So a lot of times, too, I don't, I don't know, maybe there's some really great stuff in this game and I'm just bored by the time. I don't want to spend three or four hours getting to the game, doing stuff I've done a hundred times before. And so there's that aspect a little bit too. And like I said, Outer Wilds, I don't fault them for that. Like I said, it's still on my list. I'm like, everyone says it's good. So I will at some point sit down when I'm in a very patient mood. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm going to play a four, I'm going to play four hours this today. Even if it sucks, I'm going to play it. And that way I can get to the good stuff because everyone says that there's good stuff later. And so I'm like, I'll get to that stuff. Uh, I will yeah. get to it eventually, right? Yeah, I think like less than 30 minutes if there's already spent 45. So like, not that, not that far. I think the problem far. is I take, I take the game at its word. So when yeah, there's an opening area, I go poke around in it and I'm like, oh, okay, like, what's this? What's that? I'm like, and the answer was nothing. Like you look at him and it's like, nothing happens there. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I don't know. So, so again, I, I will do it at some point. I was probably grumpy that day and not <laughs> interested. Like I probably had something. I was like, all right, I'm going to play the next thing on my list. Cause I, you know, I, I go through my games I haven't sold and oh, um, ch yeah. chance of Sonar. Have you played it? I've never heard of that. What does that say it again? Chan like, chance. C H like, like, like chanting something chanting and then Sonar it's okay. written okay. S E N A A R. Okay. It's like a language decoding version it's pretty cool you learn the grammars okay. of a new languages and then translate the language into another language it's quite uh it starts quicker <laughs> okay it starts quicker but and it takes five to six hours okay i think i have the last question no i have another question have you used jai the programming language jonathan Lowe? i have not uh i Probably should at some point here. I mean, honestly, I should probably just switch to it. I'm sure it's better than using C++ for what I'm doing. Um, and I, so here's my thing on languages. The cost of switching is like just very high. And the reason for that is like, I pretty much know how to get most things done in C very quickly. And the hard part for me is usually not managing the language. It's like figuring out like, what are the algorithms and like, how am I going to do this thing in a way that I think is like reliable and 
and it's not going to have bugs and it's going to be like zero maintenance and all this stuff. I'm thinking about those sorts of things. And a lot of times like the language is it holding me back in some places, sure. But it's not usually the hardest part, except in certain circumstances. So the switching cost is like very high. And if I'm going to switch, I'm not one of these people, like you, you see some variety of streamers. Like for example, one of my uh, favorite partner streamers, Prime, I'm on his channel a bunch. I love that channel. And he does like variety show kinds of stuff on that channel. And so it makes sense for him to do like, he's programming in Odin and then he's programming in Zig and he's programming in Rust. It's like every language under the sun, he'll just go try it. And it makes sense because that's content. It's programming content. It's like people get to see that. They get exposed to the language. He has something fun and new to do. Uh, that's not just like a boring old, like, I don't know, let's open up C again, which we all already know, right? So it's like, it's it's good. There's some people for whom it would make sense as a business proposition. And variety streamers are a paradigmatic example, but there's some people who make sense. Well, you just try whatever, try it all, right? What's the downside? None for them effectively, right? Um, unless their brain just starts to lose it, right? You could you could imagine learning too many languages and then you start to forget ones that are important to you, right? Like, or something like that. But but assuming that you don't hit that level, right? Um, but for someone like me, it's like, I actually just like programming and I like getting the things done that I want to get done. And we do a lot of experimental stuff here and I like doing that. Um, and so to switch to a new language to me is a really big ask. And I want to know that that language is going to be around forever. I want to know that the tooling is very good. I want to know that uh, I'll be able to ship on every platform and console and everything because I have all those things to see. So I'm going to move to something else. Uh, I want to know that. And I also, it needs to be a massive performance boost. If it's just like 10% or something uh, or a small improvement, that's not worth my time, right? Most languages I see people ask about Rust or something like that. I'm just like, okay, whatever, guys. Like, this is this is if anything a, a productivity downgrade. I am not going to be faster programming in Rust than I am in C. I'm not going to tell you not to use it. If the borrow checker turns you on, have fun. It's not my problem. I'm not going to tell you not to use it, but stop talking to me about it. Okay, this is obviously not meant for me. It doesn't address the kind of programming problems I work on. Go away, right? Something like JAI actually does have important features that I would be interested in. The assembler for JAI is, I'm really interested in that. It's a very interesting thing that they have that no one else has. Their metaprogramming system, no one else has anything like that, and that's awesome. I could see myself making a move to that system. And obviously I trust John. If I thought that there was something really stupid about the language, I trust that I could have a conversation with him and he would understand what I'm talking about, right? Which is not true of Rust um, or, you know, myriad other languages, depending on which language you're talking about, right? But there's designers I trust, designers I don't. I trust John to understand what I'm talking about, right? If I have a problem, he's going to be like, oh, yeah, okay, I see, right? Um, not like you shouldn't be doing that, which is the answer from language designers who don't know what they're doing, right? Uh, so so I, I, I could see myself doing some JAI work, but again, it's a big ask for me. So I just don't know. Like, I don't know what, I, what my future looks like with that. Uh, but if I was going to, if I was going to set aside time to try a language, obviously it's JAI. It's one of the only languages that has things in it that are features that are attractive to me. Is it designed primarily around the kinds of programming I'm interested in? No. But does it have features that would allow me to do that kind of programming? Yes, which is something I can't say for basically any other language that people that's on offer right now. So, okay. okay. So the last question uh, is regarding the 30 million line problem. The video you've, you've posted quite a few, uh, 2015, I think. And you remember? Yeah, I don't know. The video may not have been till 2017, but the, it was given in 2015 as privately at Intel. Yes, yes. And you were talking there about making like system level ISA with uh, to to structure all sorts of USB interfaces and all stuff that goes into the computer and motherboard in general to make it more easy to program different platforms. And you were discussing that making a momentum 
to help Intel convince other parts, let's say in, ma in management and to see that this will might work and be financially sensible. Has something happened when you look back on this? Certainly not at Intel. Uh, so I can say that that, that didn't really go over. I, I mean, they did sort of run it up the chain. So I guess what I would say is it's not so much that they didn't take it seriously. They didn't blow me off. I'll put it that way. So I don't want to make it sound like Intel is just like, eh. Um, like one of their vice presidents called me and we talked about it uh, afterwards and stuff like that. So they they kind of took it seriously, right? Like they they considered it. Um, but did they do anything? No. Like, did they actually take any steps to like look into this as a potential thing? No. Um, and fast forward today, and that's why they've lost all their market valuation, right? It was just not listening to me. If they just listened to me, <laughs> it would be awesome. <laughs> no. Um, as you can see, things have gone poorly for Intel. Listening to me would not have helped. They have their own problems that are much more serious. And so my sort of pet ideas about how we might solve some of computers' modern problems are kind of, I mean, Intel would be so lucky to be thinking about only those at this point. They're having problems even just fabbing chips, right? Uh, so, so it probably would have been a non-starter either way. Did it get any traction inside? Not really. Uh, and now, obviously, they're just, I mean, they're at a point where they, they can't be thinking about anything other than just do the chips work at all, right? Um, did it get traction outside of that? Surprisingly, yes. Uh, I hear a lot of, from people on 30 line, million line problem, especially for a video that was never made as a lecture. It's like some crappy thing I recorded from like the Handmade Hero streaming machine, right? It wasn't even presented at a conference. It wasn't done in front of my light board. It was not professionally recorded in any way. It's a super crappy version. I hear about it from people all the time. They email me. Again, my emails are not public, <laughs> right? They go email the freaking business address to talk about it. Um, so it definitely struck a chord. A lot of people, I think, correctly sense that we have a complexity problem and that it's only getting worse and not better. There is a organization called FUTO, which is a pretty cool organization. It's started by a guy named Aaron Wolf, who is ex-Yahoo, uh, made a bunch of money during the dot-com boom and does not like the way tech went and is trying to fund projects and invest in projects that can help. And uh, I've been working with them on and off for the past few years, looking at options for this. There's a lot of people interested. It could happen in the future. It's a long haul problem. I wouldn't get anyone's hopes up anytime soon, but, uh, there are people who are interested in this, and I think it's there's a it's not a zero percent chance that we might do something about it in the future. Yeah. Um, part of the problem is that it's not something I can spend full time on right now. So at some point in the future, if I do, I think that would help push the process forward further. I well, think there is. A, well, sorry, yeah? if if you were if you were to spend let's say full time or even like 80 hours a week on this, what would you do? Research, research programs that would make it better. Like how would you help? Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do, but the biggest one that I think is ex incredibly difficult and requires a lot of expertise. So it would not just be me spending a lot of time making sure it was right, but I would also want to make sure that I was talking to a number of people with experience and making sure they thought it was also right, right? So it's it's both a it's both a collaboration with a several people that I would have in mind. I'm like okay. these people okay. should also vet this thing, but also me figuring out what does that ISA actually look like, because the critical thing is designing that ISA correctly. And the thirty million problem is just saying we have a problem and we're going to need to fix this. If you had a full solution in hand, it's still hard. You got to convince people to produce these chips. You got to start to get them to be popular. You got to uh, have an infrastructure buy-in and software baseline and libraries. There's going to be this whole thing that has to happen and that's going to be hard. But the hardest part of all is getting the thing right in the first place. And you only get one shot, yeah. right? 
So that's a full-time job. It's a full-time job. It takes a year or two. You've got to really do it right, prove it out, do tons of testing. And it can only be done by people who really know what they're doing. And more than one. It's not something that one person could do themselves. You need multiple perspectives, people who really know a lot. And they have to work it out and grind it out correctly. I've seen uh, many times, like I mentioned Vulcan in passing. I've seen how, like, standards, why they suck. I've seen the process that produces the suck. You can't do that, right? You have to have a lot of grinding on tests where you test how easy it is to do each individual thing from both sides, from the hardware side, from the software side. You have to iterate ruthlessly and like really push towards getting every last thing right. The reason every 3D graphics API you've ever used has sucked is because they didn't do that, right? And so you can't afford to just be like, I sat down and typed in all the things I wanted and there's the ice. That's like, that will suck. Doesn't matter who does it. If I do it, it will suck. If anyone else does it, it will suck. That will not work, right? And you have to be very arrogant to think that it will. You can't do that. It's it's a grind and you need more than one person looking at it from more than one angle and they all need to grind pretty hard on it to make it good. And so before you would ever really go down this route, you need to do some of that stuff. And so that's the kind of thing that um, has to happen where you can make real progress. There's things you can do in the interim, just trying to get simpler SOCs that you can buy more easily, making a Raspberry Pi that didn't suck, that just uses ARM or something. That's something, it helps, gives you a little test bed. There's things you can do, but to really make the big progress, you need that solution in hand. And I'm not working on it right now and nobody else really is either. Okay. So on that optimistic note, I think we've <laughs> been going on for more than two hours. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. It was a lovely discussion. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It was great. Thank you so much. Take care, Casey. You too. Have a good one.